Hello everyone. Hello, so I'm Francois Montini, head of uh, education programs at uh, L Acoustics, live from my home office. Um, welcome to this very special webinar about line sources. Today I'm going to give you uh, what we call a lecture. Um, it has been designed as a condensed uh, version of uh, our VCLS training module. So the one is uh, actually uh, one full day. So VCLS uh, stands for Viable Curvature Line Source. Um, obviously, we won't uh, have time to cover it all. Um, uh, it's, it's already uh, quite a challenge to address uh, the topic in, uh, in one day. So imagine in, in two hours, but still I'll try to, to give you the, the essence of it. Uh, please know that um, uh, our level two training program is not focused on L acoustics product, uh, but rather on a methodology. Um, at the end, it's uh, supported by relevant background knowledge. Uh, but even though we are, we, yes, we promote the L acoustics philosophy and uh, we illustrate uh, with uh, L acoustics tool, uh, most of the content is brand agnostic. I would say almost 80% uh, uh, of uh, our level two training program is brand agnostic, and it's going to be even more the case uh, tonight in this uh, short time frame. We won't go into a um, demonstration of our tools. We'll focus uh, on the background. Um, so that's it. Uh, understanding uh, line source behavior for, for better optimization. Today, I'm not going to be fully alone on it. Uh, we have um, our application team in support uh, for the Q&A. So, what do we have? We have uh, Jean-Charles in France. Jean-Charles? Yes, hello. Yes, hello, everybody. I hope uh, that uh, like uh, every day that everybody is uh, still healthy and uh, in a great Olympic form. Uh, so welcome today to our to our uh, uh, trend uh, of understanding uh, line source behavior. Uh, bonjour à tous et bienvenue uh, notre bienvenue uh, quotidien <laughs> maintenant sur uh, uh, sur les produits uh, L Acoustics et uh, aujourd'hui donc uh, la compréhension tenter d'essayer de, de comprendre mieux uh, les comportements des uh, lignes sources à courbure uh, variable et comme l'a dit François c'est vrai que c'est déjà quelque chose qui est dur à passer en une journée, euh, donc on va essayer de faire de notre mieux en deux heures et de répondre à un maximum de vos questions. À plus tard, je laisse la place à François. Yes, uh, in the US, we have uh, Vic. Vic, how are you? All good? Yeah, quite well. Uh, looking forward to this. Welcome, everybody. Uh, in Germany, we have Thomas. Hello everybody, hello from Berlin. Hallo liebe Freunde und der leichten Unterhaltungsmusik dort draußen an den Bildschirmen. Wir freuen uns, dass ihr wieder eingeschaltet habt und äh, schauen mal, ob wir euch heute ein bisschen glücklich äh, bekommen oder glücklich herbekommen mit dem Verstehen und vor allem dem Optimieren von äh, Linienschallquellen. Habt Spaß! Okay, and then uh, Sergey, Sergey from which is in the UK. Hi Sergey. Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. Uh, really uh, glad uh, we are doing this and uh, I would like to say that tonight's webinar is going to be very intensive. Uh, this is the uh, same material uh, or same subject as the level two training, so I would encourage you to focus on the content on the screen as much as possible before we get to the Q&A sec uh, section. Of course, we will still reply to your questions, but uh, try and focus as much as possible on what you will see on the screen, what Francois has to tell. Uh, привет uh, всем, кто говорит на русском. Постараюсь ответить на ваши вопросы на русском, если на английском не можете задать, uh, и постарайтесь uh, вникнуть больше uh, в то, о чем будет uh, рассказывать Франсуа. Спасибо большое. Okay, uh, thank you, Sergey. Thank you all. We also have uh, Guillaume, which is uh, producing the webinar uh, here in France. Uh, he's uh, our new uh, uh, training manager for EMA, EA, and uh, he's going to, to help us to, to produce this, this webinar. Um, uh, so um, I think uh, uh, we should go. So 
understanding line source behavior for better optimization. Let's start with a bit of a historical perspective. So um, nearly 30 years ago uh, already, uh, Elacoustics introduced uh, the VDOSC. So it was the first full range and articulated line source. We went from a time where we would use legacy stacks of uh, um, point sources, so uh, leading to kind of incoherent behavior, uh, to now modern times where in most of the large scale event and uh, even medium scale event now, uh, we use line sources. So um, for sure it, uh, what it, it brought is a greatly improved sonic performances in terms of coverage, SPL, intelligibility with this uh, clean in your face sound, um, but it's maybe not the main reason for, for its success. I would say there is also so, some other consideration like uh, now we need to, we can use less loudspeaker elements, uh, lighter ones, smaller ones, so it, we need uh, less space in the track. Um, it's faster to deploy, which is uh, really important in a touring scenario. So all of this also participate to, to, the, to the success of uh, this technology. So uh, um, let's uh, stop just quickly on the technology. So so we won't go too deep into that because uh, we're going. We we'll try to focus on uh, on the actual behavior, which is really interesting uh, for us uh, as a user or as a listener. But still, just one slide about it. Um, so all comes from what we call the wavefront sculpture technology. All this is about mastering interferences, meaning that we will we'll try to uh, to make an arrangement, an array of loudspeaker element uh, behave as if it was a single extended source. Uh, in the lowest frequency range, that's uh, easy or quite well known from from a while. Uh, what we we need to do is that we we can just array. Uh, standard speakers. Um, as soon as the spacing between the center of the speakers is less than uh, lambda over two, so lambda being uh, the wavelength uh, of the highest operating frequency of the speaker. Now, when we go higher and higher in frequency, it quickly uh, becomes impossible uh, to uh, to follow this uh, this rule uh, because of uh, the size of the drivers, the HF drivers which are much bigger uh, than the, the wavelength uh, they are intended to, to reproduce, we cannot achieve this kind of spacing. So uh, another technical solution was needed, and for this it's uh, what we call the line source array principle. We're going to, to build an array of waveguide. So without going too much into detail, there are a set of rules to follow to design this waveguide. And the first, um, I would say the first waveguide to fulfill all of this was the DOSC waveguide. So the first of its kind uh, leading to the VDOSC. Just what maybe we can uh, remember for this is that uh, we are not going to use straight line arrays. So we're going to, to use uh, viable curvature lines, meaning that uh, we are interested in the fact that smaller is the element, larger can be the inter-element angle. So that's something which is uh, important to, to the topic uh, as a user, rather than uh, all the technological aspects which are more the manufacturer part. Still, uh, if you want to know more about uh, what's behind the technology, uh, we have two articles published on the AES. Uh, they are freely available online. Uh, on the AES website, uh, you can download them and, and go go through them. So it's um, most of the content is, is still uh, is still valid. So yes, the technology uh, evolved uh, since then, but uh, most of the concepts are, are, are valid and quite interesting uh, to go through. So now um, let's talk about uh, behavior and optimization. Uh, the statement, so the starting point for, for this and, uh, and for, for our training module is that uh, we think that the line source is still widely misunderstood. Even though it's that successful, it's the sound quality is maybe, uh, is maybe not achieved yet. Um, 
And what we could see in, uh, I would say, in the recent history of, uh, of line sources is that uh, DSP was used more and more as a, as a correction. And uh, I think, and we think at Elacoustics that uh, it's mainly due to uh, uh, to misuse and misunderstanding of line source behavior and uh, deployment. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is that we're going to explore the main design objectives, uh, which are the coverage, DSPL and the frequency response. But we're going to look at, uh, at this, uh, I would say this, uh, uh, factors on the audience because this is where we are interested into uh, optimizing the results. We are interested in what's happening uh, on the audience. We're going to focus on a single source vertical on axis. So we could say a lot about uh, off axis, about uh, uh, line source combination, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, there are already so much to say about the topic that uh, we're going to, to try to focus on this. Um, uh, a big, uh, I would say, a big part uh, of this lecture and uh, of the training is, uh, is the use of the what we call the Fresnel analysis. So you'll see that it's a powerful tool to uh, make the understanding of the line source behavior uh, much easier. Our objective, uh, really, it's to make you uh, understand that when you master the physical deployment of line source, then electronics uh, can really become an optimization. So let's go, let's try to do it. Um, we'll have a, just uh, already a, a first summary uh, of this full presentation uh, is to introduce the fact that what we're going to adopt today is a, a simplification. So we're going to have a, a binary simplification. So, uh, so in reality, all is a bit more, I would say, complex, you'll see that uh, all is about the, the trends. We're going to make you uh, understand the um, line source behavior, uh, adopting this kind of simplification. And the first one is about the frequency range. Uh, you'll see that we're going to consider that there is a high frequency range, uh, including the high mids above 1K, uh, which is where uh, we'll be able to consider that we are uh, into the, the line source behavior. And then for the lowest frequencies, uh, we'll need to consider that uh, what we have is rather a directive point source. In terms of optimization, uh, we we'll look at uh, the effect of physical deployment over the high frequencies, and we'll see that uh, we can adjust the coverage and the SPL profile. So SPL profile being um, the SPL variation along the depths of the audience. We'll see that we can optimize the frequency response flatness. For the lowest frequencies, uh, we'll see the effect of the physical deployment uh, on the absolute LF contour and on the LF contour homogeneity. So what's LF contour? It's, it's a way to express the tonal balance of your system, the tonal balance of your frequency response. And then, so we'll, we'll have a look at electronics to see how we can uh, further enhance the, the flatness of the response in the HF and uh, also uh, how we can adjust uh, the LF contour. So, first, Fresnel analysis. Um, first, we need to give a bit of perspective to the topic, uh, meaning that we are in a, in a finite world and there is no such thing as an infinitely long a line or infinitely small point, by the way. So we need to consider the relationship between the observer and the object, between the listener and the source. Um, so when you are uh, close to the source, uh, it appears as large. And this is uh, where we're going to consider that the listener is within the near field of the source. But when you are much further away, uh, the source appears as small. And this is what we're going to call the far field. In the near field, this is where we have wavefront control, meaning that uh, the wavefront uh, comes from, from the line fully and with the same shape as uh, the line source. But then at one point, there is what we call the wavefront divergence. And then we need to consider that as if the wavefront would come from a point. So basically, that's it. In the near field, uh, we have what we can uh, consider a line source behavior. Uh, 
But within the far field, we need to consider that this is a directive point source behavior. So yes, directive, why directive? Because even though if it's not a line source behavior, just the fact that we have this, uh, the existence of this near field, it gives uh, some kind of directivity to the far field. Let's move to Augustin Fresnel, so our friend, so that's a French scientist. Um, he died quite young, but uh, achieved a lot uh, in uh, his short life. Uh, he, uh, he built, I would say, the foundation for wave optics uh, globally, but uh, lots of, uh, of his concept and work has been applied globally in the wave physics in general. So maybe you know about the Fresnel lens, um, the fresnel Huygens principle, uh, the fresnel Fraunhofer uh, zones, the, um, yeah, the Fresnel zone plate, extra, etc. Today, what we're going to, uh, I would say, to, to, to use, to exploit is uh, the concept of Fresnel zones. So it was originally applied to an extended radiating of source of light. Uh, it was, uh, I would say, um, a way to for, for Fresnel to come up with something which is a semi-qualitative, semi-quantitative approach to quickly analyze what was happening in terms of interferences uh, without going into complex uh, calculations. Uh, by the way, it was uh, uh, reapplied by Christian Heil and, uh, uh, in his uh, work on in acoustics and in his work on uh, line sources. And uh, today we're going to again uh, use the same uh, kind of analysis, but rather to focus on the behavior and the on the and uh, and the usage of of the line source. So, Fresnel zones, Fresnel zones. So you see this little guy. That's Fresnel. He's happy because he's uh, in my presentation. Hello, Fresnel. So he, he's going to be our listener. Um, so all is about again binary simplification. Uh, what we're going to consider is, uh, is a world where you only have uh, uh, fully destructive or fully constructive interferences. And the first simplification uh, according to this is that we're going to consider that all the waves that are going to arrive at, at the listener uh, within a, a traveling path difference of lambda over two uh, are going to be to come from a zone which is equivalent to one single elementary uh, source. So let's do it. So the first arrival, the closest traveling, the, the closest point of the of the source from the listener is the middle of the source. That's the, the shortest traveling path. Uh, from this, we can draw a cycle. So any uh, I would say any wave coming from this cycle would arrive at the same time uh, at uh, at the listener. So now what we can do is we can just draw another cycle, but adding lambda over two to to the radius of the cycle, and this is what is going to uh, uh, I would say to, to to build our first Fresnel ring and all the the source which is contained with this, this within this first Fresnel ring here is going to be our first elementary source. Then, then we can go on. We can add another lambda over two uh, to the radius. That's another Fresnel ring. And now we, we have uh, two outer, outer elementary zones and we can go on and go on until we, con we consume the, the full line. What's really powerful with this uh, approach, even though it's it's approximative again, uh, that now we have um, each, I would say, each subsequent zone is exactly uh, in um, in opposition in terms of uh, of phase. So one according to the to the other is out of phase. And now when we are, we are looking at the outer zones, uh, they also uh, they are also of equivalent energy, meaning that out of phase and equivalent energy, they're going to cancel each other. So if we follow the analysis, it means that at the end, what remains is only the first uh, Fresnel ring and the first Fresnel zone. 
So this is really important to understand uh, all of this. So I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, to re-explain this again. Uh, please come to the presentation to have more time to to go uh, through this principle. Uh, but now we, what we're going to consider is that the energy at the listener point is coming from this first final ring, which is directly linked to the uh, wavelength of interest. So we can already uh, foresee that it's going to be uh, dependent uh, on the frequency. But first, let's look at um, the sound field uh, of a line source according to this analysis. Uh, what we can uh, we can look first is at what we call the D border, which is a border which is between the near field and the, and the far field. Uh, so that's really the furthest distance which is in the near field at a fixed frequency. So this guy, uh, this channel is quite close to the array. When uh, he moves away from the source, now you can see that you have some more element entering into the first channel ring. And when you move away and away, uh, then there is a point where all the array is within the first channel ring. That's our D border. Uh, now, if we move further away, whatever the position of the listener, uh, we have the same number of elements within the first final ring. All the elements contribute, uh, that's what we call the far field. So at the end, for line array, the near field is where not all the elements contribute, and the far field is where all the elements uh, contribute. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, based on, uh, on uh, interferences uh, analysis. So the near field actually is an interferential field. It's not necessarily bad as soon as uh, you follow the wavefront sculpture guidelines. And uh, when you think about wave, wavefront sculpture, all is about mastering interferences. It's about uh, uh, as in, within any, any sculpture, uh, when you, 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 you try to sculpt with clay, for example, you need to remove some matter to put it back, to, to shape it uh, as you want, to, to shape an object as, as you want. And this is what we are doing with the wavefront sculpture technology. We are shaping the wavefront uh, using interferences. And though still we have still uh, this D border as a transition, again, we don't have such thing, such things as a as a as a clear uh, border. All is uh, we have a transition zone, uh, which is about uh, yeah. We we don't have to to go too much into detail. Come to our training, but so um, the border is frequency dependent. So because this is linked to the wavelength, um, we have a starting point at this frequency. Uh, but let's imagine that uh, now you have a, a frequency which is twice higher, meaning that the wavelength is twice smaller. Now you, you need to move twice further away uh, to get all the elements within the first final ring. So meaning that we are pushing at the limit of the near field further and further away when we are getting higher in frequency. But <coughs> Sorry, I think uh, there is another way to see it, which is maybe a bit uh, more interesting for us, is uh, is to think uh, that what is the frequency range which is within the near field over the audience, meaning that now we're going to fix the listening distance and we're going to look at what we, we call the F border. The F border is the lowest frequency which is going to be within the near field uh, to fix listening distance. All the frequency all the frequencies below this F border uh, are going to be within the far field. Um, so let's imagine uh, that's our maximum listening distance and we have this F border uh, for this line source. Uh, what's the effect of, uh, of the size of the array? Actually, if you double the size of the array, as you can see now, uh, we we need to go lower in frequency to get all the element within the first final ring. So it means that when you increase the size of an array, you have a broader frequency range which is within the near field, uh, uh, within the audience. Now, uh, we I think we we talk a lot about uh, a straight line even in uh, in other papers or, or presentation, but most of the times the effect of curvature is overlooked. Actually, 
curvature is one of the most powerful effect of uh, of using uh, variable curvature line source. And uh, for the near field, that's a great effect. As you can see, as soon as you start to curve the line, again, when we're going to extend uh, the size of the first Fresnel ring, first Fresnel ring to be able to fit all the elements uh, within this first Fresnel ring, meaning that again we need to go lower in frequency because this is a larger wavelength, meaning that now we have again a broader frequency range within the near field, and the effect of curvature is quite powerful uh, in that regard. Now um, let's talk about the combined effect of size and curvature. I don't know if you remember that. At the beginning, uh, I was telling you that smaller is the element, uh, larger can be the inter-element angle within a, a articulated line source. So that's typically the case. When you're going to use a, a, a smaller array, most of the time you're going to have a, a larger curvature, you're going to implement larger splay angles, and both effects are going to compensate each other. So yes, a smaller line, um, if it's straight, as uh, uh, I would say a deep border which is uh, closer to the source, so I would say a near field which is not that extended. But since you're going to apply more curvature, you're going to push the deep border uh, again further away. So at the end, um, both of the uh, of the approach are going to end up with a kind of similar uh, f border. So that's it. The usual implementation is that. Uh, Smaller line usually means larger curvature, so all in all, we're going to end up with similar uh, behavior in terms of HF uh, directivity control. So, what we're going to consider is that for most array geometries, all the frequencies above 1k are within the near field over the audience. So, please come to our training to to have a, a, a deeper analysis uh, about this. But uh, just giving two examples. Uh, we have uh, two different arrays. Uh, one is is twice smaller, but uh, with a splay angle which is twice larger. And as you can see, at, at typical listening distance, uh, both of the array uh, have a, has an have an an F border, uh, an F border which is lower than 1k, uh, meaning that all the frequencies again which are above. The seven or eight hundred hertz for 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 this kind of arrays are going to be uh, within the near field, meaning that we're going to benefit from the line source behavior in the HF. Um, I don't know if uh, at that point we already have a question. Uh, we can have a a small, a really small Q and A. We have a lot to cover. Any question? There are a few, but we, uh, Tommy here, we try to to uh, push them a bit back because I think uh, there will a lot of things more to come from your side, and of course it's just an extract out of the of the big training what you already said. So we 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 are trying to push the people more to go to the training to have more mm -hmm. details and more in depth. No. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's true that uh, it's quite challenging uh, to to cover all of this in uh, uh, in such a limited time frame. So uh, let's go but on. You're doing with... really great, Francois. You're doing really great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope I'm going to survive uh, to this presentation. Uh, coverage now. So line source behavior. So uh, so above one k we have the benefit of uh, the line source behavior and for this we can consider that uh, it's like uh, having a way to do mechanical beam shaping so we are within the near field and within the near field we have the three levels of directivity control which are uh, sharpness so we are able to really concentrate focus the energy uh, somewhere and avoid that it spills on the sailing extra extra then adjustability uh, meaning that we are going to be able to determine uh, what we want uh, as a coverage uh, on the vertical uh, dimension. And regulation, so regulation is about the fact that we can have a, um, I would say, a constant directivity behavior uh, over frequencies. So let's look at uh, sharpness. 
as you can see now, uh, I, I put this final guy uh, just below the array. And as you can see now, if we draw the, 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 the Fresnel analysis, you can see that we don't have any dominant zone anymore, but only uh, a sequence of positive and negative contribution, constructive and destructive zones. Meaning that at the end, all is going to cancel, and this is why we can have that high SPL rejection out of the coverage of a line source. So that's just a mapping of a, a K1 uh, array uh, that we have with our software sound vision. And as you can see, uh, we can have a, a really a, a clear focus on, on of the energy uh, within the coverage of, of the source. So yes, you, you can see here a bit of spill um, uh, out of the coverage, but the WST um, consider that you achieve your goal as soon as the uh, energy which is out of the main coverage is at least uh, uh, 12 to 13 dB less than the energy on axis. Um, so now what about adjustability? So maybe you know that we define the coverage angle as, a, as the point of axis where you're losing 6 dB. And as you can see, when uh, looking at, uh, at, a, at a curved line source, uh, when you uh, compare uh, the, the first Fresnel uh, zone on axis and uh, the number of element uh, just on the edge of the line, we have about half of the element uh, within this first Fresnel zone. So half of the element, meaning that we're going to have minus 6 dB. So that's quite interesting that uh, really the total splay angle of a line source uh, exactly define the near field coverage limits of the source. Uh, we can uh, have a look at uh, uh, our K1 rig, uh, two different uh, total splay angle. And again, you can see that uh, uh, in each case, we have a, a clear definition of the coverage angle uh, fitting uh, the curvature of the, of the line exactly. Now, what about regulation? Uh, now let's try to apply the same analysis, but at two different frequencies, so that these frequencies are uh, both within the near field. Um, and you can see that we have uh, the second frequency, which is uh, twice uh, higher in frequency, so smaller wavelength. But at the end, that's about the same story. If we compare on axis versus uh, on the edge, uh, at, the, at the coverage limit of the source, you have about half of the element uh, within the first Fresnel ring. Meaning that for, I would say for any frequency within the near field, you could do the same analysis and you, you're going to end up with the same uh, result in terms of coverage angle. Uh, meaning that uh, this coverage angle is constant with frequency uh, with such a, a curved line. Uh, we can uh, verify it uh, again with uh, our 12K1, two different frequency range, 1K to 2K against 4K to 8K. We have uh, the same coverage angle because we are looking at frequencies which are within their near field. Their near field. Um, so now um, that's a bit different uh for for the lowest frequencies as i told you we are not within the the near field anymore uh all over the audience and for this we need to consider that we have a directive point source behavior and what's the behavior of a directive point source this is what we call a proportional q um so we don't have the three levels of directivity control but still we have the first one uh, meaning that uh, because this is directive, at least uh, we can uh, have a kind of uh, a restricted, restricted dispersion quite low in frequency. As you can see, we can, uh, uh, we can avoid the, 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 the dispersion on the sailing, for example, on stage. But that's only the first level of directivity control uh, and not all of it. To talk about this first level of directivity control, which is a restricted dispersion, uh, we have maybe one uh, frequency to remember that the lowest control frequency where that the first frequency where you have uh, a full cancellation above and below the source and 
when it happened, this is ex when exactly when you have half of the array within the first Fresnel ring and half of the array uh, within the second Fresnel ring. So this is more or less when the line length equal, equ equals the wavelength. So the curvature is going to add a bit of uh, of difference to 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 I would say to uh, to this relationship, but that's only a few words because at low frequency we are really within a, the order of very large wavelength. So all in all, uh, even if the curvature is going to to move this lowest control frequency uh, a few words down or, or up, this is what you need to remember. And this is what we get uh, with typical uh, deployment. An acoustic deployment. So with a 16K1, this is a seven meter long array. Uh, the, the lowest control frequency is at uh, 50 hertz, and for nine cara, this is 150 hertz. So that's already quite good in terms of uh, restricted dispersion. Even though if we don't have the full control, we have uh, we have the first level. So we don't have the full control, uh, uh, so it means that. Uh, I would say the behavior uh, globally within the lowest frequency range is going to be uh, linked to the size of the array mainly. Uh, and also, this is a proportional queue. It means that uh, it's going to be, I would say, uh, narrower and uh, it's going to be uh, much more narrow and narrower when you go higher and higher in frequency. So that's not a constant directivity pattern uh, with frequency. Uh, as you can see, that uh, it depends on the side, meaning that when you have, for example, a source which is half the size, uh, you're going to lose a bit of the control or you're going to have kind of the same uh, behavior, but it's going to be switch in frequency. Like you can see, uh, for example, you have the same pattern here uh, between uh, 40 and 100 hertz for a size of uh, 4.2 meter. Uh, you have this uh, about the same pattern, but at higher frequencies if you have a, a lower size. So that's the proportional Q behavior that we have uh, in, in the low frequency range. Um, that's it for the coverage. Um, now maybe we can move to to the SPL. Any any more question or maybe it's uh, it's again uh, same kind of uh, answer. Please come to our full day training to to know more and to understand all about it. So I'm not going to 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 give you a uh, too much break and uh, I'm going to to go on with a with with a sound pressure level part. So sound pressure level, uh, we're going to look at the SPL distribution over the audience. So there is a there is a lot which has been said about what's happening uh, in terms of propagation uh, within the air. We, we really don't care about this. What we are interested in is what's happening over the audience. So we need to cover an audience. We have a minimum distance to cover. We have a maximum distance to cover. And this is what we're going to, to look at. What we're going to see is that for the frequencies which are within the near field, uh, DSPL over the audience is going to be adjustable through in inter-element angles again. So what's the effect of curvature over SPL? So we thought that the energy which is really relevant at, at one listener position is the number of elements within the first Fresnel ring. So that's what is going to, to give you a, a good link with, with the SPL. Uh, and then when you start to curve the line, as you can see, uh, we, going, we start to remove some of the element from the first Fresnel ring, meaning that you're going to have a lower SPL. So again, if I curve the line a bit more, I'm going to lose in this situation two more elements. So again, I'm going to, to have a lower SPL. So all is about that. Uh, the curvature is going to give you control over uh, HF SPL locally. So at one listening position in space, um, as you can see, we are interesting in, in the HF range. So we, we talk about uh, a, um, alpha wavelength, which is about uh, uh, 17 centimeter. So that's quite, a, I would say, a narrow first Fresnel ring. Uh, 
meaning that we, we are only going to look at locally few elements. So really, the local SPL uh, is linked to the local distance to the source and to the local inter-element angles. And what we're going to, to see is that when you're going to go closer to the line, we're going to implement a larger curvature uh, to minimize the SPL. So with the line source, all is about, I would say, man managing the SPL distribution uh, by trying to lower the SPL when you go closer and closer to the source uh, to avoid to be into a, 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 a bad situation where you have a high SPL increase uh, at, at the front. So this is really about that uh, increasing splay angle while getting closer is going to minimize uh, the standard SPL increase that you you would get if you if you want if you want play with splay angles. Um, so we can talk about SPL distribution in a, in various way. Uh, the first one is uh, what we can call the absolute throw. So it it is known sometimes as um, the listening distance at which you can achieve uh, concert uh, sound level. Uh, in this presentation, we will talk uh, uh, about, I would say, same kind of ID, but we'll talk about the HFSPL that, he, that is achieved at the maximum listening distance. That's your absolute throw uh, when we, we talk into SPL and that corresponds to the, to the back HFSPL, which is over there, because yeah, usually uh, when you, you throw uh, uh, further away as the SPL decreases with distance, this is uh, what we are interested in, uh, the absolute throw as the back HF SPN. So again, uh, locally, the back HF SPL is determined by the local distance to the source and the local inter-element angle. Uh, so for the same maximum distance, how are we going to try to optimize this value? Uh, basically, uh, is increasing the SPL uh, by having minimum angle at the top. That's quite, I would say, uh, a standard uh, starting point when using an array. But we'll try to, to understand a bit more about this and also to talk about the limits of, of this approach. Um, so closing angle, as you can see, and maybe I'm go back and forth. When you start to close angle, actually, what you are doing is just that you're going to bring more elements within the first renal ring. So that's why you're going to end up with more SPL uh, at the end of the venue. So I, again, I'm closing one more element at the top. I'm going to, to add one more element within the first renal ring. So that's how it works. But as you can see, it's less and less efficient when closing more and more. So at first we went from three elements to four elements, then from four elements to five elements, then we're going to go from five to six, et cetera, et cetera. So the bit of energy that you're adding to the previous situation is less and less, uh, meaning that this approach is less and less efficient when you're closing more and more. And when you use it too much, actually, it, it can even be, I would say, um, dangerous because you're going to end up with uh, some kind of uh, aggressivity at the back, some kind of harsh sound uh, that we, we can experience with uh, not properly deploying uh, line sources. This is most of the time because people are, are closing too many angles at the top uh, of a line. So an alternative, which is most of the time used uh, as a complementary approach is overshooting. So overshooting, that's about the same story is that now we're just going to try to uh, avoid this sharp SPL drop, which which is uh, which is quite nice because we have a sharp uh, definition of the coverage, but we are just at the limit of this coverage. So we're going to uh, just to to try to implement some kind of angles angle so that uh, now by overshooting, actually, that's the same story. We're going to add one more element within the first final ring, and again. If you increase the, the site angle, you're going to uh, to add one more element uh, to the first final ring, meaning that you're going to increase the SPL for this guy at the back of the venue. That's the same story again. That's less and less efficient when overshooting more and more, but uh, this is less prone uh, to disturb the frequency response in the HF. 
now you still need to be uh, yeah to be careful with the energy that you may uh, send uh, on the back walls now it's not that uh, intuitive to i would say to understand what's the spl that you you're going to send on the back wall so i would always recommend to to check on your simulation what's the actual spl that you're going to send on the back wall even using uh, overshooting sometimes it's not much different than uh, than not using overshooting and closing a lot of angle uh, so please double check uh, and you have uh, the advantage of a much cleaner HF frequency response. Um, yeah, what I was telling you. So now let's talk a bit about the capability of your system. So your HF, uh, so your HF SPL at the back of the venue uh, is actually determined by what we call the uh, SPL per line length. Uh, the energy within the first ring is going to determine your SPL, meaning that the line length between uh, within this first final ring is going to determine your SPL, meaning again that depending on, uh, on your uh, load speaker uh, enclosures, depending on the size of it, you're going to be able to put more or less elements within this first final ring. So what, uh, what it, it's going to tell us is that Actually, the maximum SPL that you can see in specification sheets, actually, that does the, the, the do not represent the absolute throw capability. So sometimes we are fighting on numbers on spec sheet, uh, uh, playing with crest factor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the end, we forget that we are looking at only one element, and that not actually fully representative of uh, of the end result when deploying a uh, uh, line source, which is a combination of several elements. So let's do the exercise with uh, with two of our product at Telacoustics. We have the the Kara 2 and the Kiva 2. So the Kara 2 is a uh, is a uh, is bigger in size than the, the Kiva 2. Uh, in the spec sheet, it has uh, 4 dB more than than the Kiva 2. But when you are looking at uh, um, the SPL per line length, so within one meter of line, you can put more Kiva 2 than Kara 2. So at the end, uh, you kind of minimize a bit the SPL differential between both uh, in the HF. So again, we are interesting here in the in the in the frequency range, which is a uh, full line source behavior, and this is what is going to to bring us this uh, intelligibility, this uh, in your face sound, this uh, this clarity. In this frequency range, uh, you don't have this 4 dB differential; you only have 2 dB. So we can check this uh, with an actual implementation. Uh, at the back of the venue, uh, you can, for the same venue, the same coverage, you can achieve uh, about the same result. That's, that's only about 2 dB in terms of differential. And as you can see, I'm not even using the same full line length. So that's only the same number of elements. So the Kiva 2 line is, is even shorter. Uh, I'm not even considering this because actually the SPL of the, at the back of the venue is not linked to the to the line length because we are only looking at uh, at the at few elements uh, at the top of the array so that's really about the local interelement angle at the top and uh, the spl per line length of uh, lot, the lot speaker systems that, that you choose so just to again again to put you to, to give you a bit of perspective about uh, this really specific object which is a uh, which is a line source now um, let's introduce um, the relative throw. So the relative throw is uh, uh, what we can call the SPL difference between the maximum and the minimum listening distance. So another way to, to talk about it is simply the front to back HF SPL. So obviously we want to minimize this differential to have the, 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 the most homogeneous uh, SPL distribution over the audience. Uh, so let's look at uh, the two the two extreme positions. So we have the back SPL, we have the front SPL. Uh, locally, uh, each SPL is again determined by the local interelement angle. Uh, so at the back would be a, a, a angle min. This is a, what it's called 
on the on this illustration for a through distance which is called uh, d back and at the front the spl is determined by the uh, an angle which is called uh, angle max and uh, d front actually all is about the relationship between this these two positions so uh, this is linked to the distance ratio so the distance ratio is really the dis the ratio between the throw distance as a back at the back and the throw distance at the front. And the other aspect of it is the angle ratio. The angle ratio is a uh, is a ratio between uh, uh, the interelement angle uh, at the front and the interelement angle uh, at the back. So angle max uh, over angle min. Uh, that's not easy to explain this uh, quickly, but I'll try. Um, I'll try to, um, so that uh, maybe I, I did not tell you that uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation, but uh, we try to, to not put uh, any, not too many uh, complex equation in this training and even in this, uh, in, in this lecture. So this is the only one, the only real mathematical expression uh, that uh, um, you should all, all know about when working uh, about acoustics. So the SPL is linked to the intensity, which is uh, uh, itself linked to the energy density. So when we are looking at uh, uh, the differential of SPL between two positions, we can look at uh, um, the differential in terms of uh, uh, on which area the same energy uh, is spread. And we have this relationship of the differential in SPL is 10 log the area ratio. So maybe it may uh, look difficult, but actually you know about this already, that the inverse square law, um, when you have a source of defined energy uh, within a fixed angle, uh, that's spherical propagation law. Um, and we are looking at two different uh, distances. One is, is twice the first distance. As you can see, we have the same energy, which is now spread over an area which is four times greater. And that's our inverse square law. Actually, when you double the distance, uh, you, the surface area is uh, times four, you have minus six dB. Actually, uh, this is what we have here. Um, the area ratio is just the square squared relationship of the D ratio. Uh, when you double uh, the distance, you have to multiply the area by four. This is our squared relationships, relationship, sorry. And this is what, what uh, I would say, uh, uh, transform our 10 log uh, formula into a 20 log, and we end up with our uh, inverse square law. Um, now, so all is about uh, dispersion of energy over different area. Uh, now, what if uh, we spread um, now the, 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 the same energy at the same distance, uh, but over a different uh, dispersion angle? So now we have the same distance here, but we have a, a coverage angle, which is four times greater. Uh, as you can see now, we have a direct relationship between, uh, I would say, uh, the multiplication of the coverage angle and uh, the multiplication of the area over which we're going to spread the energy. Uh, and that's it. When you multiply the angle by a factor of four, uh, you lose six dB uh, because you multiply the surface area by a factor of four. That's about the same uh, uh, formula again, but just that now we don't have this squared relationship. There is a direct link uh, between the angle and the area over which you're going to spread the energy. Um, now let's try to apply it uh, to be a bit more, I would say, uh, uh, into the, 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 the real life. So even though all is uh, simplification, all is about trends uh, in, in this training, this is uh, meant to make you understand uh, what's happening there. So that's a simplification, that, but that's probably the, 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 the most accurate approximation, I would say. Uh, all is about uh, playing with uh, interelement angle to distribute your energy over the audience. So let's imagine that uh, uh, we, we are at two different distances uh, from this, this source. 
locally, we're going to consider that we are listening to a local source, uh, which is uh, these two elements, and with uh, an interelement angle uh, between these two elements. Uh, what we have here is that uh, between these two distances, uh, we have uh, double the distance, but we have an angle which is four times less. So actually, uh, if we would look at the same listening distance, uh, because we have a, a dispersion angle which is four times less, uh, we focus the energy more. We have a, a larger energy density and we end up with uh, six dB more at the same distance. But because we are listening at double of the distance, actually, now we multiply again the area by a factor four, so you lose six dB again. So at the end, uh, you have the same energy which is spread over the same surface area, you end up with the same SPL. So this is how you would achieve a constant SPL uh, over a, doub a doubling of the distance, playing uh, with the angle and implementing an interelement angle which is four times less uh, that at the closest distance. Uh, we would have come up with the same result uh, using the formula. So the loss from the D ratio is a 20 log relationship. 20 log of 2 is 6 dB. Uh, but the gain from the angle ratio is a 10 log relationship. 10, 10 log 4, uh, we gain 6 dB back. Again, we have the same SPL at the end. So SPL loss from propagation is linked to the D ratio, 20 log of the D ratio. Uh, the main dependencies to, to that is really uh, what you're going to decide to cover. So the D ratio is really the, uh, the ratio between the, the back through distance and the front through distance. So if you decide to uh, sacrifice a bit of your front coverage, uh, it means that you're going to lower the D ratio. So you're going to uh, minimize the SPL loss from propagation. There is another way to play with this is uh, playing with a trim height. If you're going to to uh, implement a higher trim height, uh, it means that you're going to increase uh, the front uh, distance to the listener. So again, you're going to lower the, the duration, you're going to lower uh, the SPL loss from, propaga from propagation. Now on top of it, it's a bit more complex. You have to add uh, air absorption in the HF, but basically uh, that's the, 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 the main uh, concept. Now, what you gain from the angles is a 10 log relationship uh, from the angle ratio. And we're going to consider that this is more or less uh, uh, equal to the 10 log of the maximum interelement angle, uh, because all in all, you're going to implement the maximum interelement angle here for the, for the bottom enclosures. And as a ratio, I would say at the top, the, the average uh, between the, the, the three top elements are in the range of, of one degree. So, uh, um, we can simplify the relationship uh, as a 10 log of uh, maximum interelement angle. So let's go a bit, a bit further uh, into that direction about um, the influence of the maximum interelement angle. Uh, we'll see that now the system capability in terms of relative throw of a system are directly linked. Uh, is directly linked to the uh, maximum interelement angle of a system. So actually, that would be the ranking for our product range at Telacoustics. We can see that the Kiva 2 can uh, go up to 15 degrees in terms uh, of uh, interelement angle. And this is the one that is going to have the, 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 the greater capability in terms of relative throw. So let's look at uh, uh, the same D ratio. So for the same number of elements, all covering the same uh, audience, and uh, implemented so that the, they have the same D ratio to cover. And you can see that the front to back SPL uh, is directly uh, following what I was just telling you. The key that uh, has the best result in terms of uh, SPL differential. This is with Kiva2 that you can achieve uh, the best SPL homo homogeneity because of its greater uh, interelement angle uh, as a maximum value. Uh, now, you can play uh, a bit with mixed arrays. That's a bit specific. Maybe we should not go too much into detail, but uh, when you have elements with different horizontal uh, setting uh, possibilities like uh, K2 or Kara2, uh, 
uh, you're going to be able to, uh, to, 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 to play with that, to, to bring a bit more SPL at the top of the venue uh, with a, a much uh, with a 70 degree uh, horizontal directivity setting. So it's going to lower a bit uh, our front to back SPL playing with this. But all in all, what you, you need to understand is that the relative throw capability is directly the inverse of the absolute throw capability. So the K1 is, uh, is probably the most powerful for the absolute throw, but because it's limited to five degree, it's not the best for uh, a very uh, large D ratio uh, and for to, to, to use a um, uh, like this. So what we use when when you when we need to I would say to address large D ratio with uh, with large system is uh, most of the time we're going to implement downfill like a K2 under K1 for example or Kara2 uh, under K1. It's going to help us to uh, uh, I would say to push uh, the limit of the relative throw by implementing a larger uh, interelement angle at the bottom and also uh, a bit uh, less powerful uh, element at the bottom of zero. Now, um, let's talk about SPL profile. So SPL profile is um, the evolution along the depth of the audience. Um, so that's really uh, now the same story again, but that we're going to look at every position. Each position, same story, that's linked to the local distance to the source and to the local interelement angle. There are various design parameters, uh, the, what you're going to define as your um, audience coverage target, uh, what is your source, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, that's really uh, difficult, I would say, to, to give some easy trend. Uh, we really need to go through a design and simulation software to, uh, to precisely uh, set and, uh, I would say, analyze what's happening all over the depths of the audience. Still, I'm going to, to try to, to simplify it uh, quickly uh, as much as I can. Uh, we can still think in terms of what we call curvature patterns. So you, we have the two extremes, uh, which are the C shape and the G shape. So the C shape, uh, this is using the same interelement angle for all the elements. So that's the best way to have a large coverage with few elements, but uh, that's not good for, for, for control because you, you are not playing with interelement angles, so you don't have any control over the, LF, uh, uh, over the SPL profile. And also you have a very poor relative source that can be even worse than a properly deployed point source. So this approach is only valid in some very specific scenario, like uh, in a stadium distributed system, where the, 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 the front distance to the source and the back distance to the source is about the same then you can uh, implement a C-shape. But uh, when you have a source located at stage and you have this kind of audience, uh, you cannot uh, use this. The so G-shape is, uh, is the other extreme. So with a G-shape, you could achieve a constant SPL all over the audience. So this is achievable with a, with a line source, just that now each time you, uh, I would say each, each time you, Let's, let's say we, we start at, at the furthest distance. Now, each time you, you come twice closer to the source, you, you need to uh, multiply the interelement angle by a factor of four. So as you can see, even with uh, our Kiva 2, we can go from one to four, then from four to 16. 16 degrees already more than our maximum interelement angle. So the limitation of this approach is that uh, you're going to be limited in terms of coverage if you want to achieve a full constant SPL uh, all over the audience. Uh, also, you're going to probably to end up with uh, some compromised wavefront integrity at the back and balance uh, between the high very HF and, and, the, and, and the high mids. So unbalanced tonality also according to the LF range. So all in all, it's, it's not a good approach. Uh, what we promote is, a, I would say, is a, is a middle approach. That's the progressive shape. That's the best compromises in terms of coverage, SPL, or frequency response. So the progressive coverage pattern is um, for the one we, we are interested in reading uh, uh, scientific articles. Uh, that's called a spiral uh, shape in in some article by uh, Mark Ureda, for example. Uh, so for you, if you want to 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 go more into the documentation of it. 
when you are implementing a progressive curvature, uh, now this is what you can achieve in terms of SPL profile. So the SPL profile, this is what we can see here. Uh, we have our, our cut view from the source. We have our audience. And just below, we have the evolution of the SPL along the depth of the audience. That's our SPL profile. Uh, the, the idea is to have uh, enough angular resolution that at least at minimum we can achieve something which is linear like this. Uh, so the angular resolution, it's again, it's, it's a bit complex, but there is a rule of thumb for this uh, globally for the same coverage angle, higher the number of elements or higher the maximum interelement angle. Again, that's really important. Higher is going to be your angular resolution. So sometimes if you don't have enough element, uh, you're not going, going to be able to have this kind of, uh, of linear shape. And now if you have enough element, uh, and maybe more than enough, this is what we call high resolution, and you'll be able to achieve what we call a composite uh, SPL profile, uh, meaning that you're going to be able to implement some kind of uh, constant SPL over some part of the audience and then implement a, a linear slope uh, for, for the other part of the audience. Um, our recommendation all in all when we, we talk about uh, SPL profile over the audience is that uh, in case you have a reference point uh, in your audience which is uh, representing the FOH uh, for uh, I would say auditory holes uh, we recommend to, to keep it within uh, 0 to 3 dB as the maximum. Uh, this is uh, because we are in control at the console. We don't want to kill the people in front by having 10 dB more uh, at the front of the audience. That's, that's really important. But you'll see that also uh, having this kind of, uh, I would say, guideline, uh, it uh, may also help uh, to optimize the tonal balance. This is something we, we're going to demonstrate uh, just a bit later. So when you don't have enough uh, angular resolution, then you end up probably with something like that. Like that. So the front to back is not necessarily different. All is about how you're going to distribute the energy between the front and the back. But what's not good with this low resolution array is that you're going to end up with a, a high uh, SPL increase between the reference point and your front audience. And this is something that most of the time uh, we're going to maybe to have just a bit because we always like to have a, just the right number of elements, maybe just not enough. So we end up with a bit uh, of an uh, HF SPL excess. And this is what we're going to be able to moderately reduce uh, via electronics, but again, not too much. So if your starting point is, is too bad, if you have a, a more than 6 dB to compensate uh, uh, for the bottom enclosures, uh, you're going to, to end up uh, on, on a dead end in terms of uh, uh, sonic quality. Uh, now, so let's talk about uh, playing uh, with electronics to try to address SPL. So there is a, a topic that uh, uh, may be interesting for you, that's gain shading. Uh, so gain shading is uh, obviously, um, you should know that's really not part of the L acoustics philosophy. That's something that we really do not recommend and uh, that we, we, we totally, uh, <coughs> sorry, we totally uh, forbid actually. Let's say, uh, you want to increase the SPL at the back uh, by adding gain on the top elements. This is what's going to happen. Actually, uh, you add SPL at, for the top elements, thinking that you're going to improve the SPL at the back. But what's happening is that because we are in a complex interferential field, what's happening is that there is an effect at the front of the audience. So you're going to create here this, this notch here. Uh, that, that is going to be a deeper and deeper and more and more you using this kind of approach. So uh, we'll try to analyze this uh, using Fresnel analysis. Uh, so actually, um, this is what, uh, what happens. We are in a situation which is uh, maybe in the, in the low mids where not, we are not fully uh, in the near field over the full audience uh, and in this specific situation at the bottom, uh, uh, we we are in the near field, but we are only few Fresnel zones. Uh, so in this situation, we have only four of them. 
meaning that the middle zones are going to cancel each other, but still we have the top zone which is still there. There is no other Fresnel zone to cancel uh, the destructive energy from this Fresnel zone. Meaning that as a starting point before gain shading, uh, it, we, uh, we, we do not really notice that because uh, the, the, the energy is quite low. Uh, so the, also the, the distance is, uh, is, is also larger. So the traveling path distance is larger. The number of elements is lower. So there is, a, I would say, low out of phase energy uh, leading to low destructive interference. But there is an interference. It's just that this is not that obvious. Again, gain shading is not going to create interference. Gain shading is going, is going to dig uh, some interferences that uh, were not detrimental uh, before gain shading. So when you add 3dB at the, for the top enclosure, what happens now is that you're going to increase the out of phase energy. And maybe you know that, uh, but when you closer are the, the out of phase energy uh, in, in this kind of situation, uh, I would say uh, larger is a destructive interference pattern. So this is what 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 we are doing, and maybe we can look at a, another situation uh, with three zones. So now, yes, we implement negative gain at the bottom, positive gain at the top. So we end up with something which is almost perfect in terms of uh, uh, SPL homogeneity. But you can see that how bad uh, as the frequency response is uh, at the front of the audience. Uh, we are we we dig uh, again uh, a bit more as the interferential uh, uh, the, the destructive interference. Uh, this is uh, because we end up with this situation where now the the two zones uh, which are out of phase and then now uh, they are they are brought to a situation where they are of equal energy, and this is where you have the maximum of the destructive interference. So that's it about the gain shading, the full range gain shading. Do not use it. Uh, do not argument that you can do it step by step. Uh, you're going to end up with the same result. Uh, the tree is, this is really not linked to the fact that you, you're going to, to implement small steps. Um, this is still bad. Uh, so we uh, totally forbid uh, any kind of gain shading full range over line source. So uh, in the low and the low mid in general, the differential gain is not acceptable, but what about high frequencies? For high frequencies, the listener is always within the near field and only few elements contribute. Also, uh, we are within the waveguide wave guide frequency range, so which is already a, a way to to to, to control uh, as the HF uh, a bit more locally. So, <clears throat> for the HF, uh, the differential gain adjustment is acceptable, and th this is what we're going to call the zoning. The zoning approach uh, uh, is implementing uh, differential EQ uh, in the HF only, and not gain shading. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to go too deep into that now because it is better to address it along with frequency response flatness. Uh, using this kind of EQ, we will be able um, also to homogenize the frequency response on top of helping a bit uh, the SPL distribution. <clears throat> Just SPL uh, again, but now talking about low frequencies. Uh, so again, we are what we are interested in is what's happening on the audience. So forget about people saying that uh, uh, in a line source, uh, the low frequencies are 6 dB per doubling of distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we are not lis listening uh, within the air on axis of the source. We are listening over the audience. So what we are in interested in is uh, what the actual projection of the energy over the audience, and this is directly linked to two, as two aspects. One is a, sh is a beam shape and was, one is a direction of the beam. As the beam shape is directly linked to the array size and the beam direction is directly linked to the source position, meaning that uh, if you're going to implement a, a, a higher or, or lower trim height, you're going to change the sight angle to address the same area. So meaning that you're going to change the relationship between uh, your source and, and your audience. 
but again, this is it depends also on on the shape of your the audience itself. Uh, now, if you have a slope in the audience, uh, you're going to implement a, a, a different source with maybe larger coverage angle and maybe a different trim height. So all in all, this is this is not that easy to I would say to predict what's happening on the audience. And this is definitely definitely not a uh, minus six dB uh, per doubling of distance over the audience. As you can see, uh, I'm just giving two examples here. Uh, one venue A, one venue B. That they looks almost the same, uh, but actually the implementation is a is a bit different. Uh, uh, one is uh, there is a, I would say a, a side angle. One is I would say is lower. Uh, then the the height of the maximum listening distance. So there is a, a specific sight angle. Uh, the other one is a bit higher than the maximum listening distance. And at the end, we end up with two different kind of behavior in terms of SPL uh, profile. Uh, as you can see, uh, what's really interesting for us is that at the end, uh, the kind of SPL profile that that we end up with in the LF is quite similar. Uh, to what we can get in the HF playing with angles. So for the venue A, we have something which is quite a linear uh, SPL profile. And for the venue B, we have typically a composite SPL profile with uh, some constant SPL up to uh, uh, DREF and then uh, a decrease in slope. So I think you can already foresee that we're going to use that uh, to our advantage. Uh, to uh, optimize the tonal balance of our system. So uh, that's the last part uh, of, uh, of this lecture. Um, uh, so first, let's talk about uh, what is the tonal balance uh, at Elacoustics. We like to define it through the LF contour, which is a differential uh, between uh, uh, the uh, frequency response within the HF over 1K and one fix uh, frequency in the LF. So in this situation at 100 Hertz, we have an LF contour of uh, 10 dB. That's uh, kind of our reference response for large systems like K1. Now this is going to vary uh, with the listener position. And this is directly linked to the distinct SPL control for the LF and the HF range. So in the HF, we saw that it's going to change depending on how you're going to set your angles. Uh, you can use composite or linear, so this is going to vary. Uh, and in the LF, uh, now we 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 cannot have full control. This is uh, this is really linked to the projection of the beam on the audience. But the result is that we end up with something which is either composite or either linear. So the idea is that uh, to optimize the tonal balance of a system. Uh, we not necessarily going to uh, uh, to play with the LF, but we're going to play with the HF. So what we're going to to do is that we're going to try to fit the HF so that they match the LF behavior. So that's an example of uh, our Sun Vision uh, soft software for 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 2D source uh, design. So we can do it in 3D, but that to focus on the on the 2D tools. Uh, you can see that we have a view of uh, the SPL profile for the HF, and you can choose another frequency range to represent the LF profile. Uh, so for this venue, for example, the venue A, I could have go for, for a composite target in the HF. This is doable, and we have quite good results, as you can see in terms of indicators, but at the end, it doesn't really fit uh, the LF. So what would be better? actually is to implement a linear uh, HF profile so that you can see you have really uh, the same uh, profile for both the LF and the HF, uh, meaning that you end up with uh, a much more uh, homogeneous LF contour. Uh, you can see here we, we have a, a, a thir at least 30% uh, better homogeneity in terms of LF contour. Now we can say that the, we can see that this, this is the other way around with the venue B. So um, we could implement a linear uh, SPL profile like this, but uh, the LF profile is telling me that uh, uh, I would better implement a composite uh, SPL profile for the HF. And you can see that now again uh, you end up with quite an optimized uh, LF contour 
in, in terms of uh, homogeneity, uh, we have quite a great improvement in terms of uh, LF contour homogeneity. Um, so that's it. Again, come to our training to know more about it. Um, we are almost at the end of this presentation. Uh, I think we, we still have a, uh, a few minutes uh, to, to, to end with this presentation and maybe we will have time to go through some Q&A. Um, I'll try to now to talk about the absolute tonal balance, meaning that just before we, we were looking at how the LF contour is going to, uh, to change from one position to the other. Now we're going to look at globally uh, uh, what's uh, the average uh, frequency response of one system and what's uh, uh, the average LF contour. So what we see is that uh, our reference response has been actually defined for a specific uh, array geometry, which is 12K1 and uh, quite a low total split angle, which is 15 degree. As soon as you're going to move one or the other of, the, of these parameters, like a number of elements or, or, or split angle, uh, we're going to, to have a change in terms of uh, absolute LF contour and in terms also of uh, a pivot frequency. So we're going to move maybe this uh, pivot frequency uh, lower uh, in frequency. Size and curvature, these are the two parameters that we're going to, to look into uh, to determine uh, what's happening there. So again, uh, using uh, our Fresnel uh, guy, uh, if you remember in the high frequencies, the listener is within the near field all over the audience. So not all the elements are within this first Fresnel ring, whatever the position. So actually, if you half the size of the array, you do not change the number of elements within this first Fresnel ring. So actually, uh, there is no effect of the size uh, over the HF uh, for this specific situation. Now for the LF, that's different uh, because we are within the far field. Uh, when you divide the number of elements by two, now you have, uh, uh, you have, you have twice a lower number of elements uh, uh, within the first final ring, meaning that half the number of elements uh, you have minus 6 dB. So that's the effect of the array size actually. Uh, so you have 12K1, you start with uh, this reference uh, curve. When uh, you implement half the size, uh, you have minus 6 dB in the LF. You do not change what's happening in the HF, but in the LF you have minus 6 dB. And here we can see that this again, this is not, a, a, I would say, a binary uh, situation. We have a transition zone uh, between the far field and the near field, which is about one octave. And this is what we can see here. Uh, we have one octave between uh, the 6 dB, uh, I would say, impact uh, and one octave uh, higher in frequency. Uh, then we don't have any change in terms of SPL. Now let's look at uh, the effect of curvature. Curvature uh, at lower frequencies, uh, so we have all the elements again within the first Fresnel ring, and if you increase the curvature, it doesn't change anything. So the curvature uh, don't have a lot of uh, impact on the SPL in the LF. But as you already know, in the HF, um, that's, uh, that's the other way around. When you increase the curvature, you're going to remove some of the element from the first Fresnel ring, meaning that you're going to have uh, less SPL. So that's the effect of curvature. The curvature is going to, more curvature is going to increase your contour, not because you're going to add LF energy, but because you're going to, uh, to remove some HF energy. So that's what's happening. Less curvature, higher uh, HFSPL, meaning that now you have a lower uh, LF contour. More curvature means uh, lower uh, HFSPL. At the end, uh, you have a larger difference between the LF and the HF, so you have a larger LF contour. So that, that's a bit counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. Uh, larger curvature is going to increase your LF contour uh, by uh, removing some of the HF, HF energy. 
now it's interesting to look into um, the same situation where we were telling you that when you use a small array, uh, most of the time you're going to implement a larger curvature. So let's imagine uh, you want to address uh, the same area, but now with 8K1 instead of 12K1. Uh, I think you all agree that to do that, I need to increase the curvature of the 8K1 to be able to cover the same uh, area. So what's happening there is that uh, the 12K1, uh, so the, sorry, the 8K1, so you have a larger curvature, so you're going to remove some of the HF energy, but because you have less element, uh, you also remove some of the LF energy. So at the end, for usual implementation, if you if you look at the same coverage, the, again, the curvature and the size are going to compensate each other, and you're going to end up with about the same frequency response. So yes, you have a, the mean SPL is less, uh, but uh, globally, uh, the LF contour is the same. And this is what we we can uh, we can check with a 9K2 over 12K2 over the same coverage. We have the same mean frequency response. Uh, it's just that with the 12K2, we have a higher mean SPL. I'm not going to go um, uh, into the, the EQ of, of the LF today because uh, that would be too long, but just for you to know that this, all in all, we have a starting point, a mechanical starting point for our frequency response, but then you can play with uh, uh, IIR filters uh, to modify it to, to your taste, to, to the need of, uh, of the program, to the habits of the mixer. This is what we call uh, um, sometimes the toning of the source. Uh, this is a contour uh, AQ approach based on uh, sometimes our tool, which are uh, mainly the LF contour part of, of the array morphing in uh, LN Network Manager. So that's a global AQ on the world source. Uh, but now I would like to focus more on the HF and we're going to look at uh, what we can address in terms of uniformity in the HF and we'll see that we're going to try to address at the same time the universe, the uniformity and uh, the contour of the of the HF, which is defined at Teleacoustics at Teleacoustics as a flat target. Um, so what's happening in the HF is directly linked to the size of the first Fresnel zone, meaning that uh, even though we have a, a really great control in the HF, still we may have a, a quite a small variation in terms of number of elements that are going to contribute at one position depending on the frequency. So just one example uh, at, for, at two positions. So I'm looking at two different uh, frequency. Uh, you can see that the balance between the element is going to be quite representative of the balance uh, in the frequency response. So at one position, we have seven elements over four. At one of the other position, we have five elements over three. So we are, I say, I would say quite close in terms of, uh, of, uh, of balance, but still, uh, it's it's not exactly the same ratio between uh, frequencies, so this is why you end up with a small vi variation in the HF there and there, but that's moderate. Now, um, there is a, another uh, phenomenon which is uh, well known, which is uh, due to the air absorption, uh, due to atmospheric condition. So you're going to have absorption of the HF energy that is going to increase risk frequency and distance. So that's some of the typical patterns that, that we can have at, at different distances. But this is also part of the equation, something that we would like to address maybe to, to compensate. So when we look at electronic optimization in the HF, so what we, we told you is that we're going to be able to use a differential EQ among the elements between not, because not all the elements uh, contribute at one position. Our recommendation for this is to use linear phase FIR filters. Uh, this is what we are we Im we implement in Atel Acoustics, and this is how we can uh, uh, I would say uh, preserve the integrity of the wavefront. So we are going to use FIR filters that are going to change the gain at some frequencies, but with no impact on the phase. So all the wavefront is still isophase at the exit of the waveguide. But we're going to apply um, differential uh, AQ uh, for different zoning groups in the HF and for different frequency range. 
<coughs> so for this at Elacoustics, we have four uh, FIR plateau and also a tool which is called the AirComp, which is actually a construct of linear phase uh, FIR filters as well. So all is included, I would say, in the same approach of zoning groups. Um, just uh, one slide about uh, processing granularity. Uh, I think it's quite important to understand that high processing granularity is not necessary uh, with this approach. Actually, uh, being too discrete is going to consume more headroom and also to be more expensive because you need uh, uh, more DSP, more amplifiers. Uh, to Just to um, illustrate this, I'm just looking at, at the 8K at this position, and we know that uh, further away we have more elements uh, within the first Fresnel ring. So in this situation, we have four elements. Uh, just an example, uh, if you want to have plus 3 dB at 8K, the best way to do it is to add 3 dB on the on the four elements. Then you have a full return on investment. There is a direct uh, uh, 3 dB gain uh, by applying 3 dB on the, all the four elements. But if you would start to only play with uh, with few elements at the top, like two, actually to have the same result, uh, because you're only implementing uh, uh, gain on two, uh, you need to add 5 dB on this element to have the same impact in terms of uh, gain at the back of the venue. So that's what we can call low efficiency. You're going to consume more headroom, so that's, that's not the good approach. So again, all of this is valid when using uh, linear phase FIR filters. Uh, some of the competitors are not using uh, this kind of filter, so they are, they are playing with phase, and when you are playing with phase, that's, that's uh, another object. So we cannot consider anymore that's, uh, uh, that's a standard line source because you kind of scramble with all the Fresnel zones now, uh, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, story, another, almost another, uh, technological object. Um, but with a, with a clean mechanical line source, uh, this is the way to do it. Uh, differential EQ through HF zoning. Um, the fact is that uh, when you're getting high, uh, lower in the HF frequency range or uh, further away in distance, uh, we have more and more elements to consider in the EQ. Uh, so again, this is important to understand that this is not only about uh, the elements that are facing uh, you or other measurement microphone, by the way. Um, so this is uh, really difficult to, to anticipate. Actually, the portion of the audience which is affected by an EQ is going to increase also uh, when you get lower in frequency or further away in distance. So there is an example. Uh, this element, for example, uh, they're going to participate to as a frequency response for this guy and for this guy. So there is all this audience area that could be affected by some differential EQ on this element. This is not only what's happening in front of this element. And the same for, for this guy. This guy is, is going to have an influence for, for this position and this position. So this is really difficult to anticipate all of this. A measurement subset cannot fully character, characterize the complex interaction between elements. We are really not into, uh, uh, sometime I, I can hear about the soul custody uh, uh, kind of behavior. This is not the case. We are in, in a complex interfer interferential field, and this is really difficult to be able to uh, uh, to address this uh, with a subset of measurement where you're going to, to sample uh, the audience with only few uh, measurement location. Um, this is why we, we really uh, consider that the only way to go is to do what we call on uh, design uh, tuning uh, through uh, now what we have in, in SunVision is a is auto filter tool, uh, but doing uh, it in simulation uh, allow you to have a proper view of all what's happening over the audience. And when you do it properly, this is what you can achieve, uh, starting with an optimized deployment because that's the starting point and adding the el electronics on top of it, uh, you can see how good you can, uh, uh, I would say, really optimize your frequency response. So in that case, this is only two elements per zoning groups. This is what we consider to be the best return on investment. Uh, again, do not, we do not need to, to go for, for one element per DSP to have a, a good result. I think this is uh, how we can achieve this uh, really uh, electronics as uh, icing on the cake. 
again, uh, all is linked to the fact that we have a properly mechanical solution from the start. Uh, we cannot address wrong deployment. Uh, electronics uh, should not be used uh, to address wrong deployment. And that's the end of this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a few uh, outcomes to, to end with that. Um, so summary is that uh, line source behavior in the HF uh, is uh, achievable because the audience is uh, in the near field. Uh, we have a sharp dis dispersion, which is precisely defined by the total splay of the array. We can uh, precisely adjust the SPL profile along the depth of the audience playing with, playing with Intel element angle, and we can further optimize it uh, with linear phase FIR filters on zoning groups. For the low frequencies, we need to consider that we only have a directive point source uh, because uh, at least part of the audience is within the far field. We still have the benefit of the restricted dispersion, uh, meaning that we can avoid uh, and uh, I would say uh, improve the direct to reverberant ratio, for example, minimize the spill on stage, extra, extra. But we are in a proportional Q kind of behavior, which is directly uh, determined by the array size. The tonal balance homogenization, so we can, uh, I would say, have control over it, but not really by playing with the ELF, but rather by uh, playing with the HF and trying to match uh, the HF behavior with what's happening in the ELF. Uh, now, as the ELF contours, the global uh, mean average of your tonal balance is going to be determined by uh, the size of, the, of your array uh, and your curvature and is to be adjusted with a global EQ on the world source. Uh, in Sun Vision software, uh, last year we implemented a lot of tools. So, following all the, the research that has been done for, for the training module, uh, in parallel, we, uh, we launched uh, the development of new tools uh, to, to better optimize uh, your design of line sources. So, I would say the first uh, important aspect of it is that now you have a more visual and numer numerical indicators to really assess the quality of your design. So you can assess your performance in terms of coverage, SPL, frequency response. So come to our training to, to know more about this. Uh, and also, last but not least, we have this uh, algorithm that's been uh, introduced last year with the auto display in it, which is for me really the key uh, to, uh, I would say, a proper expert expertise of uh, line source deployment now. And uh, now that we save you time with uh, all the interelement tangle settings, and uh, now the real expertise is uh, in to the analysis of uh, the auto display in its solution. This is how you can really uh, have a good preview of the capability of, of your system and uh, really do the good choices or compromises in terms of uh, source choice, source position, uh, coverage target, extra, extra, before going uh, too deep into the optimization. Then, uh, once you did that, that's quite easy. Just uh, just click on uh, optimize to precisely fit uh, your your SPL profile to to your user defined target, and then auto filter FIR uh, to optimize uh, your frequency response uh, according um, um, to the HF uh, flatness uh, target. Um, yeah, maybe some important information is there is no black box uh, algorithm implemented uh, here. All the settings are accessible, adjustable, so you can still adjust uh, one angle there and there. Uh, the algorithm is blind to uh, to your focus, so it's going, it, it's going to, to look at the full audience and trying to, to have the, the best uh, all over the audience, but if you want to uh, uh, to avoid uh, one specific area uh, or to put the focus on the FOH position, you can still uh, access to uh, both to the local internal angle and also to all the FIR filters. Uh, you can uh, look at it and, uh, and see if you can do better than the algorithm. Uh, yes, so that's it. So thank you for for to 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 still be, be here with me uh, after this uh, this quite intensive lecture. So maybe I need to to have a little drink and uh, 
and uh, listen to, to some of your questions, maybe. Vic, Thomas, Jean-Charles, maybe you will answer all of your questions uh, uh, within the Q&A directly. So, um, what I can tell is that uh, it's uh, it was quite intense in two hours. Uh, I think you got most of the concept, but uh, obviously, uh, usually we cover this in one full day. Uh, so I, I greatly uh, invite you to come to this full training day. Uh, I hope that it was useful for everybody, even the one that are not using uh, L Acoustics uh, loudspeaker element. Uh, I'm sure that there are lots of information that can be useful for uh, for any kind of uh, of deployment deployment. But still, please use our products; they are the best. <laughs> but um, thank you for 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 listening to me. And uh, what else? Maybe we should uh, close the session with this. Everyone saying uh, bye bye. Stay tuned for our next webinars. Next week we'll have a, a, a full week around the uh, loudspeaker system system tuning approach uh, at Acoustics using uh, M1 uh, mainly. So stay tuned for for next week's semin uh, seminars webinars, and uh, have a good weekend, all of you. Bye bye.